Buzz Bugs and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs and I'm so excited and we have the epic war paint on today because I am going to be talking and sitting down with my friend John from Stated Clearly who took some really interesting footage on some poo from his backyard. So he got this footage and he was like, I want to know more about it. Let's talk to my bug friends. So without further ado, John and I are going to talk about the science behind stuff on dog poo. So John, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, so my name's John Perry. I run Stated Clearly, which is an animation group. We do stuff on uh, genetics and evolution and chemistry normally. But, you know, during the uh, the lockdown from the disease that I can't say out loud on YouTube because they'll demonetize us, the uh, during lockdown for this, you know, I spent a lot of time not being able to go out even during summer. I decided that I would make a little wildlife documentary in my own backyard. And I found this, this wasp. It was hanging out on a dog turd and, like, battling flies that would come by. If you want to see that, it's up there in the card. So you can just click it and watch it. Yeah, and I'm here to talk to you to figure out what's what's going on, what's what's behind this behavior. But I never thought of wasps as hunters. I've seen them steal food off my plate when I'm having a picnic, but hunting flies, I thought that was really crazy. But my first question to you is, what species is it? And then, are we supposed to call it a hornet or a wasp? Yeah, so this is a bald-faced hornet, and as straightforward as that name sounds like it should be, it's not. Because why would it be? Generally, we reserve the word hornet to refer to insects or wasps in the genus Vespa. So the European hornet is Vespa crabro, and that is a true hornet because it's in the genus Vespa. But your bald-faced hornet is actually in the genus of the yellow jackets. It's just a really big yellow jacket, and so people are like, oh my god, like big, scary, extra big, scary flying thing. We'll call it a hornet, but right, right. it's actually a, a large yellow jacket. Okay. It's in the genus Doliocop, Doliocop Vespula, which is like the diminutive form of Vespula. So yellow jackets are actually, is also like another name that is not very good because it includes two, at least two different genera. This is one of the genera of the yellow jackets. It's complicated. So all hornets are wasps, but not all wasps are hornets. Yes. Okay. In fact, most wasps are not hornets. Um, there are about 160,000, maybe more wasps described. Thousand. We think that there should be 500,000 wasps described. So yeah. that's like, that's where some of the problem with these names is coming from. It's just the fact that there's just so many insects, it's hard to just put a blanket name on them yeah. and yeah. have it come out and encompass the things you want and not encompass the things you don't want. Right. And of course, you know, scientists, when they try and name things, they try and name things by the evolutionary history of that thing, which sometimes isn't even figured out yet. Mm -hmm. So that can screw up naming processes. And then the public in general, like just lay people, when they name something, they, they care about what it does or what it looks like. So mm -hmm. you get this conflict between the way that scientists name things and the way the public names things. So let's watch one of these videos. I just want to go over the hunting behavior and just, I don't know, we can just watch the video, pause it a little bit. So this is actually slowed down. This is half speed. I filmed it in 60 frames per second and we're playing it back at 30. And you see, she just, she just goes for the flies. And at first I didn't think she was hunting because she is not good yeah, I mean, she misses almost every time and she's not being patient, you know, like she doesn't seem to be skilled. So I thought that she was actually just defending territory when I first saw this. It wasn't until I watched the footage that I saw she was actually trying to cap capture these and eat them. So. Yes. So there's a couple things going on here. Um, the first is that insect eyes work very differently than our eyes. Our eyes can just pretty much detect things, whether they're moving or they're not moving, but insect eyes, and a lot of this research has been done in mantises, but, research, but insect eyes specifically are focused on movement. So if something is still, they usually can't tell exactly what it is. To get that bifocal, that bifocal vision that they need for you know, actually capturing things out of the air, is set up a little bit differently than our eyes. Also, yeah. the compound eye works completely differently. So the compound eye has 
all of these different lenses in them. And the most extreme form is the dragonfly, which has about 40,000 lenses in their eyes, which is absolutely incredible. Versus something like some ants only have like a handful. Yeah. I think there's one ant that only has like one, like has only one lens for its compound eye. It's pretty crazy. It doesn't give them a full picture of the world where they can see detail. Each lens just gives them like one color and one light gradient data point. There's a lot of processing that happens mm -hmm. between the insect eye and the brain, which is to, is true for humans too. There's a lot of brain processing that happens. Yeah. So we think that each lens can see like a kind of swash, like it has different light detecting pigments in it, but the insect brain will put all of those individual images together, kind of like a panoramic to make okay. up a full image. Wasps have about four to 5,000 individual lenses in their eyes, mm -hmm. whereas something like a dragonfly, which is the most efficient predator on the planet at 95% efficiency has about 40,000 lenses. To get better vision, you just have to add more lenses, which is why a dragonfly's head is basically all eyeball. So there's the main compound eyes, and then there's the uh, little spots on the forehead. Yep, a lot of insects have those. Those are called ocelli, plural ocellus, I believe is the singular. And those are just simple light dark receptors. That's all they detect. We think it helps them detect overhead predators. And so like while their big compound eyes are helping them find food and find mates and live their life among the brush, those little silly on the top are letting them know if there are overhead predators in which they should escape from. So she she keeps, <laughs> so she's basically living on a turd and she keeps cleaning her hands and it just seems a little bit uh, <laughs> counterproductive to clean yourself while sitting on a turd. What's going on there? Insects are really clean animals in general. So it's just in their behavior to groom themselves periodically. Like cockroaches groom themselves every 30 seconds to a minute. And it's just wow. to help keep their feet and their mouth and their antennae just free of gunk and free of bacteria and free of anything that'll like clog those things up. We, we just saw, I just saw her again, just try and make a kill at just the worst possible time. There's no chance that she could possibly have made this kill. And she just keeps going for it. She's really spending a lot of energy. Is it possible that she's new at this? Or are they just always this clumsy? So there's a couple of things going on here. One is that I would kind of blame this more in the fly than the wasp because yeah. flies are really agile. So the way that the fly is set up, it has its first pair of wings. Those are the four wings. That is what it's doing all of its flying with. And then its hind wings have been reduced into these little nub club structures that rotate and move. And those are basically like gyroscopes or stabilizing functions. And so flies can use those to help them maneuver really agilely. These flies are really agile because they have these haltiers, is what they're called, that help stabilize them in the air and they can move them. The other thing about those haltiers is that they are covered in hair. Insects in general are covered in little sensitive hairs that are getting information about air pressure, things that are coming towards them. Mm. And 50% of the flies sensitive hairs are on those haltiers or on those little gyroscope structures. The fly can feel her coming from like a mile away. That's why so, you can't slap a fly very easily either because it right, just feels you coming right. before you're even halfway So you're there. saying that insects, the, like the, the default form is to have four wings and then flies, the, the hind wings have reduced and so there are these little dense ball things, gyroscope yeah. things that they just wave around to help them orient mm -hmm. and switch directions and they act as sensors. So they've got the hairs to sense things. Wasps still have four wings. Yeah, wasps have four wings. They have a hooking mechanism between their forewing and their hind wing. So if we look at like mm -hmm. the ecology of the animal, the fly has no venom. It basically has no way to protect itself. The fly just has to like GTFO as quickly as possible if something is going to attack it. It doesn't have yeah. venom, it doesn't have poison, its exoskeleton isn't particularly strong. It's just like, you know, just like your average Joe, except the fact that it can fly away really quickly. Yeah. The wasp, on the other hand, has a different life history. It can protect itself. It has pretty powerful venom. And not only that, but it also needs to capture prey and then bring it home. So it needs a lot of flight power just because it's trying to 
just grab whatever it's eating and bring it back. So it's not yeah. really focused so much on being agile as it is just like a strong flyer. So your first wing and your hind wing have a hooking mechanism where the hind wing literally hooks onto the fore wing of the wasp and it makes it like a larger, more stable plane to fly with. Do butterflies have that too? Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the ways that we can tell where butterflies are, like how evolutionarily related they are, because there's mm. a simple hooking mechanism where there's like this, this little lobe where it's just kind of like sticks onto the forewing to keep it together. And then in the more advanced butterflies, there's actually like a little hair that fits into a hook and like holds oh, wow. it together. Wow. And it's a more advanced, like sophisticated system. Mm -hmm. Do we see anything with like three sets of wings? Is, is that, does that ever happen? Or is four wings the, the max? Four wings seems to be the max. And there's a lot of debate about what wings evolved from, like what specific structures wings evolved from. Yeah. There aren't any examples of six winged insects, not yet at least. It's important to note that while we don't have insects with three sets of wings, there are insects that have the normal four wings, there are insects that have reduced or removed hind wings, there are insects that have reduced or modified four wings, and you do have insects that have lost their wings altogether, right? So there's yeah. a group of insects that hadn't evolved the wings yet, so like your silverfish never evolutionarily, they're too primitive to even be in like the winged insect group, but okay. then even among the winged insects, there have been insects that have retroactively lost the ability to fly and lost their wings. These are mainly like parasites. When you say that they're primitive, you mean that their common ancestor with flying insects existed before flight had evolved? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then we have other, other insects that clearly have lost their wings over evolutionary time. I remember learning that the beetle shell is it's the four wings that are modified into the shell, right? Yeah, they've been modified into a hardened, hardened four wing to cover the hind wings. And if you look at the ecology of a beetle, like they're not strong flyers. They don't claim to be, they don't need to be. And they're like on the ground, battling ground dwelling things like ants and yeah. crashing through logs and sticks and stuff. So those, that really hard four wing is protecting those soft membranous wings. So that way they yeah. can fly. As you watch these videos, just, just note how difficult it is to catch a fly because it only took her like a few minutes to catch a fly that I was watching, but she tried and failed many, many times. And you're saying that's not because she's a bad hunter. It's because flies are super awesome at avoiding being killed. Pretty much, yeah. Flies are just hard. Although it's important to note that while insects are using movement, these wasps can also use olfactory senses to find their prey, which how, yeah. might be how she found that turd to begin with. But they'll also just try and pounce on things and just, just hope for the best. Like there's anecdotal evidence of these wasps, the yellow jackets, pouncing on nails that have been on a barn, right? So you have like at okay. the side of your barn and then you have like the nails in them. So they'll pounce on one nail and be like, oh, nope, that's not a bug. And then they'll go to the next <laughs> nail and be like, ha! Oh, that one's not a bug either. <laughs> so it seems to be like they just do a lot of kind of trial and error anyway. And a lot of farmers and agriculture people really like yellow jackets and other wasps because they are eating pest species. They are really good at eating not just these flies, but also stable flies and um, like flesh flies. And many paper wasps will actually eat caterpillars. So farmers tend to lick them because caterpillars eat your crops. Yeah. So they're actually really good for pest control. Don't kill them. They yeah. are beautiful and they don't want to sting you. It's only really common if you get close to their nest. Okay. And if you don't realize that you're there. They do try and warn you. They hmm. tend to like all come out of their nest and they'll turn and they'll look at you and they'll put their wings up and they'll buzz and squeak at you. They do try and warn you first that you're getting too close. And it's because venom is really expensive to build and make. And so the wasp isn't going to want to waste it, quote unquote, if you're not being a threat and if it can't eat you. It's injecting that venom in the fly when it attacks the fly, finally. Is that yes. venom causing neurological disorders? Like, it, or, you know, in humans, it causes extreme pain. Is it doing something mm -hmm. similar to the fly? Wasp and bee venom is very complicated. It is a whole cocktail, and there seems to be specific parts of that cocktail that are 
only for vertebrates or potential would-be predators that just cause pain. So there's like kinids that cause pain and they, there's actually a type of venom that makes you release histamine which causes pain and like stimulates the immune system and does a little bit of tissue damage in that area. But really it's not doing that much damage to you as it is just telling you like, ow, it hurt, leave me alone. Whereas it has a whole bunch of other types of venoms to specifically break down and um, paralyze insects. I've got some close-up footage of the, f the flies and I've just kind of got this on loop. I'm, I'm not a good cameraman. I don't normally, I'm normally an animator. So I only got a couple seconds <laughs> of good focus of the flies. So I just got that on loop here. But I was just struck by how pretty these things are. You know, when I zoomed in nice and close, the coloration here, I mean, you have to ignore the fact that they're walking on a dog turd. <laughs> But, but <laughs> that's an important know. part of their biology, okay? <laughs> yeah. At this scale, it just looks like a boulder or something. So these flies are bottle flies or blow flies. They're in the family Califoridae. If I were to hedge a guess, I would say this is the genus Lucilia just based on their color. But I would definitely need a microscope to confirm that because fly identification is counting the number of hairs and the position of those hairs on the thorax, okay? It's complicated. <laughs> Lucilia and Califords in general are your major decomposers. They're breaking down all of your organic material. They're actually the first things to a body. If you're like, if you if you like CSI and forensic science, these guys are definitely the like one of the specific species that you'll be needing to understand and learn their biology because they're first usually to a body and they're the species that most of the research has been done when we're looking at how bodies decompose. So they're really important for forensic science. They're also really just important for decomposing, doing all that dirty work that no one else wants to do. Are these flies, are they here to eat or to lay eggs or is it both? Both, but they're mainly there to lay eggs. These flies will come to whatever like rotting thing and they will lay their eggs directly into the food source. And that's because their maggots or their larvae don't have any legs. Mm -hmm. So they have to basically put their eggs directly on a food source. So that way the maggot there has food right away. They don't even have like a fully developed mouth. There's just like mouth hooks. It's like these two little hooks and they just like eat and pull their way through the, the stuff. But that's how it gets decomposed. They're gorgeous. <laughs> and then here uh, towards the end of this video here, you see them all fly away and then mm -hmm. you see the wasp come in. All of this drama, this is life and death drama. This is a predator hunting its prey. This is insane. This is just happening in my backyard. And this little dog right here is the one that caused all of this life and death drama to occur in my <laughs> backyard. She is responsible for this. Good dog. The whole start of an ecosystem meticulously created by a dog butt. Also, if you are enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and also subscribe and also leave your thoughts in the thought box if you like this kind of interview. So that way I do more of them. Okay, so here I've got some footage. I'm playing it at half speed, which I, everything we've been seeing so far is, is, is slowed down to half speed. I slow it down even further still just in post editing. So it's kind of blurry, the, uh, the extra slow motion. But I just alternate between, you know, medium slow motion and extra slow motion here. So we can see what's going on because this this little move that she does is really cool. She's got her back towards the fly. She senses it somehow, turns around and immediately jumps. She does in the air sort of like a, not really a flip, but like a spin flip thing, which is hard to see because it's so blurry, but it's like a kind of a spin flip. Then she lands on her back, which looks risky, but at that scale, apparently it's not. I feel like we need to be like sports commentators. Like, and there she <laughs> yeah. goes. She senses the fly. She turns around. She does a triple axle backflip before catching it in <laughs> midair. Oh, and she stabilizes it right at the last second, holding onto it with that stinger and delivering that venom. Wow, what a show. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. That's good. The really interesting part is you can see her sting. Again, it's a little bit blurry because of the speed of all this, but you can see her make that sting. And how long does she hold that stinger in there typically? It looks like she just goes in, injects venom, and, and pulls out. Yeah, that seems to be all, all that she needs. In addition to just delivering that venom, it helps her stabilize it, right? Because she doesn't have 
raptorial forelegs, which are those forelegs that like mantises have that yeah. just go out and like grab things and like spy, like spike them. She doesn't have those. So all she has are those jaws, which as we saw, she was a little bit behind the fly to begin with. So she opened up those jaws, but it was a little bit too late. So she goes after it and she just kind of grabs it. And so mm -hmm. that fly is like a little bit slippery. That exoskeleton is smooth. It's buzzing angrily. It can easily just kind of slip out of her legs. So she delivers that sting not only to incapacitate it about as quickly as possible, Hello, yeah. Puka. <laughs> but she also is kind of using it as a stabilization how if you're trying to carry something big and slippery you might use your hip to like help you balance it she's yeah. delivering that sting and just holding it there as like an extra like stabilization and anchor point and then after it's incapacitated it's easier for her to kind of move around with it trying to think about the evolution of venom the stinger is a modified ovipositor so mm -hmm. the ovipositor in insects that don't sting at all in, in most species is really uh, maneuverable. It's, it's already like an extra arm. So here yeah. she's using her ovipositor both to stabilize her prey and to inject venom into it. Wasps have that constricted waist and that really helps them move that abdomen around in any possible way that they can. So that way they can like at this like tumbling upside down doesn't matter i can curl my abdomen around it and get that stinger in that kind of biology that maneuverability of that stinging apparatus is really really important i don't think we know the context in which venom first evolved do we like what the species was doing i definitely don't <laughs> someone might i've not just studying fossils, that, should, that would probably be impossible to figure out because the fossil doesn't tell you if it has venom or not. But you could imagine that if venom was evolving in a hunting species of bug that had an ovipositor, it mm -hmm. could have been using that ovipositor to stabilize, you know, just, just as an extra arm to stabilize and, and subdue its prey. And then eventually mm -hmm. it could start squirting ovodepositor fluids in there. And then if some of those happened to cause a reaction in the animal, it would be an advantage. And so evolution could could to grab hold of that and take it off until we have full on legitimate stinger and venom from a modified ovipositor. So she, she uses her stinger as an ovipositor, but also as a stinger, right? So she's still laying eggs with that, with the stinger. Um, she is not because she is a eusocial insect. So she can't lay eggs, but the queen, yes, the queen would be using that ovipositor to lay her eggs and to sting. One thing that's really interesting is that at least with wasps, or yellow jackets, the queen releases a type of pheromone that cuts the fertility of the workers. The workers mm. theoretically would be able to lay eggs and mate and all that stuff, um, but they, the pheromones that they're getting from the queen basically cut all of that off. So they're just appendages of the queen. They're collecting food for her babies, for, for their sisters. They are the greater good. <laughs> How is the queen decided? The wasp life cycle is that once the colony starts dying off, there are a couple that remain and they will go mate. And when they mate, they will then hibernate. They'll hibernate in like under some bark or in a nice warm, dry place. And then in the spring, start their new colony. About 90% of the colonies will fail. So chances are, probably won't make it, but if you do make it, you are getting resources and food and you are building your nest out of paper. And then you are laying your eggs, you're getting that first batch going. You are going and collecting prey items to feed the larva. You're collecting paper and fibers to make the paper nest. You, you, you're taking care of the nest. You're growing up the babies. I mean, there's a lot you're doing. So this is one individual doing everything. Yeah, it's just one individual okay. doing everything. So then after that first wave of workers comes out, then the queen mainly focuses on laying eggs and the workers start you know, taking care of the colony and getting paper and going out and, and doing the hunting. It seems that just certain wasps are more likely to survive the winter. Like they just have the different enzymes and proteins that help them tolerate the cold. Some of them just survive instead of dying off and those become queens. So each colony yes. only lasts one year. The game is to make as many babies as possible. Some of those will survive the winter and the ones that do will become queens of their own. Yes. Oh, that's very different than bees. That's really cool. It's very different than bees, yeah. <laughs> How many males would a colony produce typically? Or do you know? I'm not sure. It's some like small fraction. 
and only mm -hmm. only when it gets into the period that they need to do mating i don't yeah. know maybe 10 to 20 percent of the colony would be males and they only live for like a week or so and then they just like mate and then die the last chunk of footage i apologize people it's completely out of focus because i use autofocus and i'm trying to focus on a wasp and a bunch of bushes but i saw her doing something again when i filmed this i didn't know that she was eating she was doing something in a bush <laughs> It's important to note that while we're focused on the wasp and this particular hunting experience, they will eat a wide range of things. They need fibers for making the paper nest. They need sugars, so that's why they sometimes are around your fruit and around your Coca-Cola because they need sugars, just like energy. Flight is high energy. Chasing these flies is high energy, so sugar is doing a lot of that for them. And they'll also eat meat as well, like just like meat meat. You know, if a large animal like a cow or a horse has an open wound, there's evidence of yellow jackets landing, taking a bite out of that and bringing it home as well. So you're saying they're omnivorous, that they'll yes. they eat all sorts of stuff. Mm. Oh, yeah, they eat cool. pollen and nectar too. I have seen yellow jackets, what I thought were yellow jackets, pollinating flowers, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the adults, because they're doing so much high energy work, are eating mainly sugars. So mm. those are the ones that are like mainly around your fruit and your Coca-Cola. They're bringing back all of these protein packed things like your meat and your flies to the colony because that's what they're feeding the larva. The larva need uh -huh. a lot of protein and fats to continue their development all the way up through like larva and then the pupa stage and then emerging as a beautiful wasp at the end. <laughs> so most of all of uh -huh. this is going to the colony and is not being eaten directly by that wasp. So, so the adults are mainly vegetarian, yet they hunt for their babies. Mm -hmm. I've got this blurry footage. You can clearly see that she is doing something to a fly. I thought, after, when I first watched this, I thought she must be eating the fly. You're saying she's processing it for mm -hmm. her babies. In this processing, she'll make it easier to carry. Insects are complicated. <laughs> Inside the insect, they don't work yeah. like we do. They're basically just like little water balloons that are held together with that exoskeleton. So their blood is just free flowing in there and it's a high sugar blood. She might be clipping off some of the appendages that you don't need, like legs or just crunchy chitin and don't have any nutritional value and she's probably clipping off the wings, but she's probably taking sips of whatever blood is seeping out of those holes as a little energy drink because their blood is very high in sugar. And then just like yeah. manipulating it and holding it and making sure that she can fly back home with it. Because I mean, if you look at this fly, it's about like half yeah. her size. Like that's, that's no small feat. Also getting rid of the legs and the wings helps reduce the weight of the animal that she's carrying back. Good. Did the venom kill the fly? P probably by this point, it's, it's it is no more. <laughs> Dismembering a live animal and then flying back with it with no arms and wings. It can't okay, do so that's what parasitoids do. So there's spider wasps that specifically attack spiders. Yeah. They'll cut all the legs off the spider. This is after the spider's paralyzed. So they'll deliver a sting to paralyze the spider. <laughs> the spider is alive, just can't do anything. They clip the legs off of that spider and then like fly to a burrow with it and then lay their egg on it and then their larva will eat that still alive di but dismembered and paralyzed spider uh, over the course of a week. It stays alive for a week. Yes. Arms ripped yep. off, slowly getting eaten yep. alive. So oh. the larva will actually focus on drinking the blood first mm. and then move on to the non-essential organs before moving on to essential organs like the heart and the, like the brain and the nervous system that will finally kill the spider. So they keep it alive, like literally. And that keeps everything fresh. Yeah, exactly. Fresh food. If you don't have a refrigerator, you have to slowly mutilate your victims. <laughs> exactly. Why is it that ripping off the arms doesn't kill it? I mean, if you rip off our arms, we bleed to death in a matter of minutes, I would assume. Maybe hours, but probably minutes. Why, why is a spider not going to bleed to death when its arms are ripped off? Let's look at the big picture first. You ask these questions, and then I have like a hundred thoughts out all at once. <laughs> 
So if you look at it from an insect's yeah. pers perspective or an arthropod's perspective, you got lots of legs. And if every time you lost a leg, it killed you, like that would not be generally advantageous for you. The chances right. of something grabbing you and grabbing a leg is pretty high. And if you can just detach that leg and continue on with your merry life with one less leg, then you know you might reproduce tomorrow. So good on you. There's lots of mechanisms in insects and arthropods to help prevent the bleeding out. There's like a little channel. It's like a little, I don't know, membranous, gatey thing. When the leg is ripped off, the subsequent change in pressure makes it like shut closed. And then there are, there's basically scabbing factors. So it'll mm -hmm. make the hemolymph, which is the insect blood, dry in that area and clot. And you have this channel that closes to prevent a lot of major blood loss. There are some insects that okay. will just like eject their legs just because losing a leg is way better than losing your life. They've got little shutoff valves for their mm -hmm. circulatory system so that if you lose a if you lose a, a leg, it's no big deal. Just yeah. a flesh wound. Just Merely a, a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound. I believe I remember reading somewhere that they will take the head off of it as well. There's not a lot in the head either hmm. for nutrition. The the wasp are really looking for so in the thorax, there are these big muscles to control the wings. That's full of a lot of protein. And then in the abdomen, you have these big things called fat bodies. And if these flies were female, which probably they were if they were visiting poo, because they would like deliver, they would deliver, yeah. they would lay eggs. But eating all of those eggs as well, full of protein, full of fats, full of nutrients. So like the hmm. thorax of the abdomen is like the only real part that's like worth any value. And again, if you're a wasp and you now think about your life, you're cradling this, your prey item that's like half your weight, you're flying away, you're trying to navigate bushes and brush, you're trying to make it home, which is not very close, and you don't want to get eaten by your own damn predator because then <laughs> that predator will have a two for one. Yeah. So just like dropping as much weight as possible is really important for these wasps to do. There's not a lot going on inside the insect head. It's mostly eyes and yeah. the brain of the insect. It has a central nervous system, which is like the brain brain, but the rest of the insect brain is actually split up throughout the body. So all you really have in the head okay. are these things called mushroom bodies, which are these two little small things that connect into the antennae and give a lot of sensory information. There's like the, the sensory part of the brain that's taking in all that sensory information, which is also a pretty small part of the brain. And then you have these ganglions, which run the okay. length of the body and control the legs and control the wings, control the digestive system. And those are your big nerve clusters that are doing all of that stuff so they're not so centralized like we are no they're not so that's why a cockroach can live seven days with its head cut off because all that's in the head <laughs> is this information like oh i can see this thing or i can sense these things with my antennae the cockroach without a head can still feel with its feet still know what's going on and like can crash into things and know that i went the wrong way and just happily bumble around until it dies of starvation or dehydration Oh man, that, oh, that was that was great. That this is I know so much more now. <laughs> Excellent. I just all I all I knew when I started this is that hey look there's a wasp thing guarding a turd from flies. What's going on there? Turns out she was not guarding it at all. She was hunting. It's good to have entomologist friends, you know. And thank you for doing your makeup like a wasp. Mm -mm. Yes, the war paint. Well, are there any parting words of wisdom that you have? Yes. Wasps look scary and they have venom. They're just animals living their everyday lives. So I hope that you came away from this, thought that it was interesting, see wasps in a new light and are not so afraid of them. My parting words would just be, I was able to sit there in my backyard filming a turd really close up to a wasp and she did not care that I was there. She did not try to sting me. I had never felt in danger. It seems to me that we don't need to be panicked when they get inside the car or inside your room. You don't need to kill it. It's just calmly let it out. It's, it is not interested in hurting you. It's got something else in mind. So long as you don't smash it, so long as you don't try and mess with its nest, it's not going to try and sting you. Tone it down with the fear. Again, though, you don't want to happen across a nest or disturb a nest because then you will get attacked. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Well, love bugs, I hope that you really liked that interview. Again, if you like this kind of style and want to see more of it, leave your thoughts in the thought box below, and I will see you all next week. Over here is a video from this playlist, and down here is a video recommended to you by the YouTube algorithm. That's it. Bye.